the channel was declining naturally. And I just didn't have any energy to build a new brand. A lot of things felt like they were crumbling in my life. So I had this idea of what if I just stopped? What if I just dropped everything, left my life in LA to go travel around the world on a self-discovery journey? And that's what I did. So if I asked you, will you ever return to social media? You won't have an answer. I have no idea. People ask me, yeah, what are you going to do next? And my mind is so far away from next, it's now. And the quote that I really liked was smile and the world will smile back. If you put out good energy, you'll receive good energy. If you're kind, then people will be kind to you. I, I guess my desire for, for truth and clarity is bigger than my ego in a way. Like obviously I still have an ego, but I care more about understanding and having clarity on it than caring that I look good or, you know, that people don't invalidate me. So that's why you dress like that today. <laughs> What's your why? Have a purpose, have a mission with your content because that's how you're going to add value and that's how you're going to go deeper and impact people. People buy your why, not your what. Delina Mai Kako, welcome to Keep It Aloha, a podcast that keeps it aloha by throwing out shakas and minoakas all day, every day. I'm your host Kamaka and I got a big minoaka today because I am so stoked for this much anticipated episode. But before we introduce our guests, I gotta ask you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash kamakadias if you want to support us for as little as $3 a month. This is an independent podcast and we rely on our sponsors and our loyal supporters, supporters to keep us going. If supporting us with money is not for you, but you still love this podcast, please consider leaving us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It helps out so much with the algorithm and helps us get bigger opportunities in the future. I read every single review because I appreciate it so much. And to prove it, I want to share this review from Nate.N458. This person says, a must-listen podcast for everyone. As a California boy who isn't from the islands, the Polynesian culture is one that I deeply respect and strive to incorporate into my own life. I love the stewardship and respect that the people of the island nations hold for the land and the oceans, as well for the love that people have for one another. The culture is absolutely life-changing and every time I visit the islands, I always try to soak up the lessons that the people I met have taught me. This podcast is such a refreshing rem reminder of what's really important in life and that change can come from the smallest forms. Mahalo Kamaka and crew for giving people a piece of aloha. Mahalo Nate.N458 for this awesome review. All right, now let's introduce our amazing guest today. Support for this podcast comes from Texco in Hawaii, which features 58 convenient locations across the state. Fueling up at Texaco is fast and easy when you use the Texaco mobile app to pay at the pump. The Texaco mobile app is a contactless way to pay for fuel so you can get in and out of the gas station quickly. Fuel your car and fuel yourself. Pick up your favorite local snacks and ice cold drinks at your neighborhood Texaco today. Texaco at Tecron, driving performance. Our guest today is a content creator from all over the world. This self-made entrepreneur found success on YouTube and Facebook where he uses his platform and Smile to create positive, happy, and healthy spaces around us. He founded Smile Squad with the mission to make the world better one smile at a time. His hard work and dedication to his craft has garnered him over 7 million followers and over 2 billion views throughout his social media channels. Most recently, he traveled around the U.S. for a year, living with 10 different families, learning what it is to be American. And one of those families happened to be mine. He is the king of smiles, my Palala. His name is Markian Benamu. Aloha, Markian. Welcome to the podcast here at ID8 Studios. How are you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Yes. I'm I'm kind of not shocked. It's, it's surreal having you here. Yeah. And it's only been a year, you know, after you came to Hilo, we recorded the that series, what it's like to be, or I'm living with a Hawaiian family. Yeah. I didn't expect to see you for a couple of years, but, you know, you've been traveling for the last half a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, you found your way in the Pacific. So I'm stoked that you're here and we can do this. Yeah. We've just been hanging out. Yeah. Chatting yeah. as friends too. Yeah. Which is cool. That's what, that's what I, I loved about you when you came. It wasn't just like a business trip like we actually grew a, a genuine friendship and really enjoyed the conversations and it wasn't just because you're famous that 
<laughs> I, I like. To, oh, you feel uh, like we're friends? Oh, oh I, I need to catch up with that then. Jordan, can we cut this out? I just came here for the podcast. <laughs> so I fly throughout the F word <laughs> real fast. <laughs> it, it, it was interesting having my guests stay with me and then driving them around and then coming to the podcast, having us set up. I was just leaving you outside and I was, I felt like, oh, I feel like I should check on him or something because <laughs> you're my guest in the real world and it, for the podcast. So it's a weird yeah. dynamic for me. I've been sleeping at your house for yeah. the last two days. <laughs> and it's, and it's, uh, it's also difficult for me because I don't want to ask you too many things because in my head I'm like, oh, we got to save for the podcast. Yeah. So I'm kind of, I'm trying to refrain from asking some questions and trying to keep it more it's like general based. But yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll get into all stuff. of it today. Yeah. Yeah. So how we start on the podcast, we like to get to know the guests and we start at the beginning. Where are you from? Where are you grad? And what was it like growing up? Oh, already starting with the tough questions. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from? One of the toughest questions for me to answer. Um, I'll give you my nationality, which is French American. Um, but the reason why it's tough to answer that question is because I grew up in Russia, Spain, and Hong Kong. My mom's American. My dad's French. I was born in England. So it's <laughs> there's there's no place that I really identify with in the sense of like, this is my country, my people. And there's a term for people like me, which is third culture kid. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. But short answer is I'm French American. Sometimes I say I'm from Spain. Hmm. Marbella? Mar Marbella, yeah. Marbella. Exactly. Okay. And you were, you were there kind of recently? Yeah. Yeah, I visited okay. this year. I go back there like once a year, maybe twice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Que guay. Que guay. <laughs> Look at you. All right. So I know this isn't a normal question for you because we say it all the time in Hawaii. Where are you grad? How, do you, how would you answer that? How do you even interpret that is question? That, <laughs> uh, grad, like grad like grad from high school. high school okay yeah high school well, i went to two high schools one in spain okay. and one in hong kong <laughs> so um mix mix grad uh yeah <laughs> hey, well, what's answer. the name i'm just curious to of get the name of the high the schools one was called laude in spain and the other one was called kellett in hong kong and they're both both british schools so i even oh. have like i was in british i have british friends in british environments so yeah that adds to the complexity of cultures. Did you ever have a British accent growing up speaking English? No, but you know what's crazy is my sister had a British accent. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, because... Oh, I think we talked about this. Yeah, I had an American accent because my mom's American, mm -hmm. so I picked that up. And then for some reason, my sister had more of a British accent. That's And, so and we're only two years apart. Now it's kind of, her accent's kind of mellowed out mm -hmm. into generic international accent, maybe like mine a little bit. But yeah, that, wow. was, that was weird. So, I mean, you've... I'm sure people are already confused. They're trying to trace <laughs> or like connect the dots and figure out like, okay, what, what just happened? He's from everywhere and he was born here and he lived here and went to school here and whatever. Yep. So what was it like growing up through all of that? And was there a certain reason? Like, what, what, like where, where your family, uh, what was your family doing that led to those moves? Yeah, often people think of like military family or diplomat family. Uh, in my case, it was um, my dad's an entrepreneur. So that gave us the freedom to move around. Plus, we are mixed internationally. Like my parents are from two different places. So there was no, we don't have many roots in any, any particular place. Our extended family is kind of spread out. So there's nowhere where we had to be in a way. Um, and then we just love to travel. So we moved to Spain a little bit for the quality of life. And our mm -hmm. grand, my grandparents were there. And, then and we, the paella. And the paella. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, the, the black paella with the squid ink. It's delicious. Yeah. And then we moved to Hong Kong for the experience, like, which uh, surprises people a lot of the times because it's quite a random reason to move. But my mm -hmm. dad thought it was a good idea to explore more of Asia, to be close to China, uh, which he predicts is going to be like big in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and just for the experience. And Hong Kong is just such an amazing city. And I, I loved it. And overall, I had a really positive experience growing up around the world, which a lot of TCKs or third culture kids will have mixed reviews with mm -hmm. their upbringing. Um, some people find it very lonely and some people find it really, they struggle a lot with making friends and then leaving them and then making mm -hmm. friends and then leaving them to a new place. But I think I moved at good ages. So at seven years old when I didn't like have much of an mm -hmm. identity. Uh, and then at 16 when the excitement of moving to Hong Kong was greater than the pain of leaving Spain. Mm -hmm. So... I had a really positive upbringing and very fortunate to be able to travel around the world yeah. with my family. 
this j- just came to my mind because I know you and I know you play soccer or football. And football, I, yeah. I know you, um, you're just, he was just watching some games right before he came, actually. Yeah. Uh, and do you think that helped you connect with people in all over the world? Because I feel like one common thing in places outside of America is soccer, football. Yeah. Like everywhere you go, everybody loves it. I mean, even here too, but you know, it's bigger outside of America. Yeah. Actually, football was how I made uh, Spanish friends in Spain mm-hmm. because I went to a British school. So there were, there were some Spanish people there, but they were bilingual. Of course, they weren't like the local, local Spanish people. So I have a lot of friends actually from football in Spain. And then in Hong Kong, I played football there too in a, in a decent men's league and got exposed to more people. It's, it's, just, it's a way of meeting people. Mm-hmm. It's a way of, it's a hobby. It's a new community. Um, I loved it. Yeah. So let, let's dive in a little bit more to the third culture kid, because that's just a term that I learned last year when I met you. And you made videos all about like different cultures and what it's like to kind of discover your identity. Mm-hmm. And it's so relatable to everyone here in Hawaii because we're mixed plates. There's, we come from all different backgrounds and, you know, there's Hapa people. It's like half Japanese, half white, or you got like people who are Hawaiian and Filipino and then some sort of other like Caucasian mm-hmm. ethnicity and you grow like you could even not be Hawaiian, but grow up with the Hawaiian culture, and it it's confusing yeah. for a lot of people. And you you had so much exposure to s- certain cultures. Did you ever gravitate towards a certain one, or did you always just kind of revert to like French American? Um. Well, it was hard for me to feel much American or French because growing up, because I never lived there. I never lived in France mm-hmm. and I never lived in the U.S. until I was 18 and then w- went to L.A. for college. S- but then I didn't feel Spanish when I was living in Spain, even though I could speak Spanish, but I'm not, I'm not a local, mm-hmm. so I don't fit in there. And then in Hong Kong, uh, people speak English, so it's easy to get around, but obviously I'm not Chinese and I'm not British either. So not knowing where you fit in is a totally common experience for third culture kids and what... Um, what makes it so solid as an identity. And I can explain what third culture kid is. A third culture kid is someone who grew up with a mix of identities, cultural identities. So technically it comes from the the mix of your host culture, which is where you live, and your parents' culture. So if any of those are two or more cultures, like you lived in one place, but your parents are from a different place, mm-hmm. or your parents are both from different places, then that makes its own third culture, mm-hmm. which... um where's where the term third culture kid comes from and once i found that term i was so happy to find something that finally describes my experience and my identity and it's it's kind of not having a cultural identity makes its own identity mm. and whenever i meet people who who are a mix then it, i always feel so so happy and comforted to be you around people who understand easily. yeah that that experience yeah at what point in your life or in your childhood, did you kind of realize this identity crisis or like, I don't feel like I belong to anywhere? I wouldn't ever say that it, 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 it led me to a crisis like some people have, but I never really had a good answer or an attachment to a country or a place. Um, I think when I kind of moved... I think as I moved to different countries, when people ask me where I'm from, my answer would always change. Mm. <laughs> so sometimes I would say I'm from Spain. Uh, when I'm in the U.S., I say I'm from Spain. Because if I said I'm French American, they'd be like, okay, where in America are you from? And I'm like, nowhere, because I didn't, I didn't live here or grow up here. So I even feel confused talking about it now. Yeah, I know. There's probably people here, now that I think about it, that are third culture kid. Maybe military families or people who have families of immigrants. Yeah, I mean, like you said, everyone in Hawaii, like, who's mixed is a third culture kid. So are, are we all third culture kids here? Yeah. Oh, you are. I'm a third culture kid. Yes. <laughs> you are. And I think what's, what, what makes people put, uh, put a little bit of context to it is that it's a spectrum mm-hmm. in the sense that some people might just be a mix of two cultures and they grew up in the same place. So they generally have a sense of belonging mm-hmm. and then the other end of the spectrum which is maybe closer to where I'm at is where you're a mix of so many things where you don't where you feel lost mm-hmm. so some people yeah 
are less confused, so people are more confused. Yeah. But the concept or the, the concept of having a mixed cultural identity or background is that ex TCK experience of feeling like you can adapt in different places, mm -hmm. of being generally more open-minded because you've been exposed to, to more things. So, yeah, I I think that's the one thing I love about third culture kids is that you you have so much exposure to other cultures and other people. So you're generally a little bit more open minded. Your perspective on the world is a little bit more broad. And I, I feel like I only got that when I traveled outside of Hawaii, when I studied abroad in Spain and lived abroad in other places. That's when I my mind really opened up. And I, I feel like talking with you is it's it's so refreshing because you just get it yeah you you have that world view and you you're very self aware and i know you've been going on some uh cool retreats and whatever we'll, we'll talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit more but uh your your whole life kind of has been a a journey of self discovery from the start even if you didn't know it or not and the big thing i guess like the your claim to fame is when you started making content right and what, so what was the motivation for doing that? And how did you get started doing doing that and starting the Smile Squad? Smile Squad. Smile Squad. I, I started making YouTube videos when I was 15 years old. And it started because as a, as a, as a teenager, I watched YouTube growing up. I didn't watch much TV. Was it, did you watch much TV? I was uh, like really young. I was like cartoons, like cartoons on Saturdays, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Dragon Ball Z, all, all that. Yeah, And then as I got older, it was YouTube. In 20, 2011, I think YouTube started? 2000. 2010. No, uh, 2007. Two, 2007. 2006. 2006. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 2006. So it was like when I was like in middle school, going into high school, I think. Yeah. Um. So that was my YouTube era. But since the start, I was like all YouTube. Oh, like so you're OG. Sm OG YouTube, Smosh, Ryan Higa. Um, and you waited this long to make content. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, in 2011, I posted my first videos like uh, me doing poetry. It's on, oh. it's on YouTube. And then I'll do songs with my friends. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I would write it. I wouldn't sing. I'm not a singer. Okay. A little yeah. Patreon exclusive. There. Yeah. We yeah, got to yeah. see that. Um, but I started when I was 15 years old. Um, I, I created a business with my dad. It was called Subscriber Club. And it was a monetization platform for YouTubers. So actually, it's a similar idea to Patreon. Mm. Um, it was just an idea that we kind of created together because my dad's an entrepreneur. And I learned a lot about business from him. And because I had this business for YouTubers, it made sense for me to create a YouTube channel to understand how like the back end works for YouTubers. The business subscriber club failed, but I kept making videos. And then I did it throughout high school and then throughout college. And then I dropped out of college when it really took off and built Smile Squad, which is our comedy channel. I found this formula of comedy skits that were very relatable, that were positive and that worked. And once I found that formula, I kept building that that channel out. I hired a team, built into a media company, and then built uh, another channel, the Mark Yan channel, where we did like cultural vlogs, and then stopped this year. So it's been yeah, a, so a ten year chapter of my life. Recently retired. <laughs> retired from social media as a content creator. Yeah. So if people are wondering where where he has been, that's that's what's been going on. He got burnt out from making content for ten years, and then he's just. I was like, I'm going to pack up and just travel the world and live my life, yeah. which I, I commend. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a still surreal to, to be in this position and to, to say, um, to close the chapter, like mm -hmm. even knowing that it's an option. And it, like you said, last, yeah. year, last year I was burnt out. I'd been doing it for 10 years, uh, managing people, building a company that was, it was stressful and I'd never done it before. So there was a lot of learning experiences that came with that. And the channel was was declining naturally. We made the same style of content for years and it, people got bored of it. Of course, it got outdated and I just didn't have any energy to build it, build a new brand. And a lot of things felt like they were crumbling in my life. So I had this idea of what if I just stopped? What if I just stopped, dropped everything, left my life in LA to go travel around the world on a self-discovery journey? And that's what I did. So I've been traveling around the world for the last six months. And this is my first social media appearance. Yeah, I, no, I, I'm honored that, you know, you're making your first social media appearance on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, it's it's very noble of you, but, and brave, I feel like, to do that because, I mean, 
you have a, a fan base of over what seven million, maybe more. Probably, yeah. Probably. I, I don't, I'm not sure. And it's scary to just leave all of that. You know, with all those numbers, it's. I feel like even if you transition into something else, you could still make money some other way, turn it into another business venture. But you really just listen to yourself and you're now, that's what we say in Hawaii, like your gut, like your innermost being. Mm -hmm. And you just did what was best for you. Yeah. Uh, and I think people got to look at that as somebody who's young and already making this tough decision um, as something very commendable because there's people that stay in their line of work for years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe even 40 years in a job that they hate or they're just doing something just to get by, you know, they're not really pursuing their passion. You see a lot of people at like 40 change their career or whatever, which, you know, sometimes it takes you that long to discover what, what you really want. Um, yeah. The question that, that was in my mind, like as I'm, as I'm going through this process and as I considered that I could just stop and just travel and I've saved up some money to do that, um, was at what, at what point does it stop? Like, at what point do you stop do working in this cycle um and do you just work for the rest of your life to save up money and then when you're old then you spend it or can you take a break and then take a step back and figure out what you actually want to do in your life and what fulfills you at each chapter of your life because i loved my social media experience for the time that it was and then i was ready to move on so it worked for me for a period of my life and then now it's a different period of my life and maybe it'll come back or maybe it won't. So mm. I don't know what will happen in the future. Yeah. So if I asked you, will you ever return to social media? You won't have an answer. I have no idea. When mm -hmm. people, people ask me, yeah, what are you going to do next? And my mind is so far away from next. It's now. <laughs> That's why my, my mind is, is just enjoy my life right now and just traveling and taking advantage of this privilege that I have to be able to go travel without working and learn and see different cultures and learn about myself because that's ultimately the purpose is discover myself because I've never, never wondered or, or explored myself in that way because the last 10 years of my life has been about doing, building the business, making a YouTube video every week, uh, growing the channel, making money, all these things. And so my motto for this chapter is stop doing and start being mm -hmm. and focus on the things that I didn't prioritize before, which I almost consciously, I was, I was very conscious about prioritizing business first before, but now it's like, oh, how can I explore more of my friendships or my family or myself instead of the, the business and the work? That's super cool. It almost makes me a little scared about my career path. I feel like I'm, I'm in that grind mode where I'm building and I'm hustling and growing things. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, geez, when will this ever end? At what point does this end? And I just take a break. I think the best thing you can do is just be conscious about how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think I wouldn't be able to take, have the luxury of traveling right now if I didn't work all those years. And all those years, again, they led to so much impact in the world to all the people that we reached, that, that we inspired with our content. So I'm really grateful for that chapter. And I'm grateful that I was able to break the cycle mm -hmm. when it felt right. And yeah. like you said, it's, it's the gut feeling. When I, when I had this idea of like, wait, what if I just stopped and went to travel? It felt right. And that was the only signal that I needed to pursue that. Yeah. It's cool that you're so aware of it too, because you see a lot of athletes, they don't know when to retire and they stay in way longer than they should have. And then they just keep losing. They keep embarrassing themselves or because they just don't know when to quit because they're like, okay, what's life after this? This is all I know. It comes, so much comes down to our perception of our own identity. And I think a lot of people attach their identity to their work. Mm -hmm. So for an athlete, for example, it's like, if I'm not an athlete, then who am I? Mm -hmm. And that's scary for a lot of people because they, they, they fear what that might look like. And I think a lot of self of my self discovery was been, who, who am I? That was the big question last year for me to figure out it's who am I? And uh, I did, I did some retreats. I did a silent retreat, which was super epic. I did some workshops. I did some seminars. I like wanted to try all these different types of personal development resources. Just traveling alone has been such an incredible opportunity for me to be with myself every day and to be aware of my every thought, every emotion that comes up to understand myself better. So it's been really powerful. Wow. Where, where are some places you've been 
over the last couple months? Uh, I've done 16 countries in the last six months. Wow. <laughs> People don't even do that in 16 years. <laughs> yeah, it's. I did. I started in Mexico. Then I went to North Africa. Then I went to Europe. Then I went to Asia. Then Australia. Then the Pacific Islands. And now I'm, I'm going to go back to LA to go to South America probably. So I've literally completed a, a tour of the world, which is crazy. Uh, and I think what would be even crazier would be to find a way if I could do all the seven continents. Yeah. And and anybody got some Antarctica <laughs> connects. Hook yeah. this brought up. <laughs> that's that's that'll be the the final challenge, final yeah. boss. <laughs> yeah. Super cool. Well, I'm sure we'll we'll get back to uh, some of your journey of self discovery, but I do want to talk about the series that you did where you traveled around the US to, staying with 10 families because that's how we first connected. Mm -hmm. And I, and that's how a lot of people in Hawaii uh discovered you even though you were pretty well known already. He, people were recognizing him in Hilo of all of all the places. That's, That's cool. when I knew that he was well known, uh, yeah. that his content <laughs> reaches a lot more than just people on the, you know, the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, maybe just kind of start at the beginning. What was your idea for creating that and then how we connected? So I had this, I, I love making videos about cultures, of course, because it's who I am, a mix of cultures. And I... I had this idea for a series, which was to live with 10 families around the U.S. to learn what it means to be American. Each family would be from a different ethnicity. And the reason why I wanted to do this is it was kind of uh, to learn about myself in a way, because I'm half American and my mom's American, but I never grew up in the U.S. And I wanted to learn what does this part of me mean? What does it mean to be American? I think when we think of an American, we generally just think of like one or two types of people. But America is so diverse and there's so many types of people in America. So I lived with 10 different families. Yours was one of them, of course. Uh, I lived with a Mexican-American family, an Italian-American family, Native American family, Black American. And it was probably my favorite series that I've ever filmed because I, I learned about so many cultures in the most immersive way, most personal way, where I lived in their house. I slept, slept in their house. I joined you. We went for like five days around. We we, we were the town. longest uh, one, right? You and the Native American. Oh, Native okay. American was also five five days, um, and it was it was so fun. Mm -hmm. And and I got to see what being American looks like for different people. So what was your? I don't want you to answer like well, what was your your answer of like what it is to be American is, but what was your biggest takeaway from that that whole experience? Just that. Being American means different things to different Americans. Uh, in some places, people are identify strongly and very proud of being American. Think of like military family that I lived with. Then you have the Hawaiians who are, I'm not American. Then you have the Texans who are like, I'm American, but I'm Texan first. Like we're, we like both, but mm -hmm. Texan is, is important. So, and then you have the Cuban Americans who are very grateful to be here for the opportunity. So, Wow, different perspectives. Huh? Yeah, everyone has different perspectives and each one has different cultures. The the food they eat is different. The way that you greet people is different. And we're this is all the same country, but so many different ways of life, so many different perspectives on life. So I it was really cool to experience them all. Yeah. So if I asked you what is an American, how would you answer that? I would answer by saying that I don't really have an answer. I was hoping by the end of the series to have an answer, right? And I'd be like, this is, what does it mean to be American? Here it is, I mm -hmm. figured it out. But I, I don't have an answer. And I guess my answer would be that it means so many different things to different people. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 um, it's valuable to, to just know that, that, it, that there are different communities and that way we can, this country can be more connected and um, rather than divided by realizing that people live different ways and they have different cultures while also having a lot of similarities mm -hmm. where things like family values was consistent throughout all of the, the families and love and affection and all these things and food. So it was really awesome. Yeah. I think I wrote about that once uh, when I was in the Peace Corps and going through my identity crisis as, as a Hawaiian and American working for the American government, thinking about all of that, like, what does it even mean to be American? What does it mean to be Hawaiian? Um, if I, I feel like the Texans, like, yes, on paper, um, you know, nationality, we're American. 
but I'm Hawaiian first. I'm grateful. To, I feel like I, I have a mix of all the perspectives of like the Cubans. I'm grateful to be American because of the opportunities that come with being American. And I know people hate on America, but if you've been to other countries, then this place ain't that bad. There are a lot worse countries out there yeah this with less rights and whatever and, and i'm not trying to like back up america and say like america's great but it's all it always could be worse we can acknowledge the privileges that we have living so here much yeah so much other privilege. countries yeah. with less resources have yeah huge have. privileges here trust me um there there are uh mm -hmm. and then yeah through refl reflection i really thought like the beauty of being american is that we're all different is that if you want to know what an American is like, go ask people. Go ask an African American, go ask a European American, a Mexican American, a Hawaiian American, whatever it is. And that's how you get your answer. And then your answer would be like Markian's. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just everybody has their own definition. Everybody has their own perspective of it. And, you know, we're all unique in the sense that we're kind of all the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's just a weird paradox sometimes, but that's what it is. Is, is that how your yeah. poetry video from 2011 went? <laughs> yeah, yeah, bars right there. It, <laughs> except a lot more rhymes. I don't know if I rhymed at all in that. No, you're missing the rhymes. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, guys. Yeah, so what what made you interested in coming to uh, Hawaii and reaching out to to this guy over here? Miss little old me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew that I was going to do 10 families, and I knew that obviously there are more than 10 cultures in the U.S., so I wanted to do, represent as much of the U.S. as possible. And truthfully, or I didn't know much about Hawaiian culture, really. I didn't know anything about it. I had been to Hawaii once with my family, but totally tourist style of traveling. Mm -hmm. So it was more curiosity more than anything. And then what I usually do to find a family is I'll try and um, find people on Instagram who are part of those communities, message 50 people, 100 people, whatever. And then eventually there's one family who gets back to me who's like, I like your mission. I want to contribute and share my culture with you. Come stay at my house, which is what you did. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I found the perfect person. Yeah. With you. How did you find me? Just through Instagram, through hashtags, Hawaii, Aloha, uh, you know, creator, whatever. Uh -huh. um, and it, it was, it. whenever I found a creator, it was almost always a bonus for the mm -hmm. series because they had the perspective of like, okay, we need to film content. We need to show different things. And you, you brought me to like so many things in the mm -hmm. days that we, we're together, so that was perfect. Yeah. Did you reach out to any other people in Hawaii? Yeah. I don't know who they are, but <laughs> I did. I'm curious now, too. I wonder who you reached out to. I get, yeah. I messaged other people, but they didn't They didn't get back to me. Wow. That's messed up. I know. They're regretting this. <laughs> yeah. Now. No, but I remember seeing that. I'm like, who is this guy? But then I, I remember when I was in Madagascar, somebody mentioned your name. That's how oh, I recognized really? you. Wow. One of my my Malagasy friends, I remember because because you're big worldwide. So Facebook and in yeah. in Madagascar, everybody has Facebook. That's like the go to uh, application because you can get a cheap Facebook plan with your phone. Mm -hmm. So everybody watches your video on Facebook. So the, I was like, I feel like I heard about this person before. So I looked into you and I, I love the mission. I mean, you sent a good, good message. And I was I was just grateful that you reached out to me. Because I feel like I could give you a truly authentic experience. Whereas you could have been with anybody. Um, but you happen to be with a native Hawaiian who speaks the language and who has a lot of connections. Um, and I told you to come during Merry Monarch, which is one of the best times to be in Hawaii, especially Hilo. It's like the Super Bowl of, of Hilo, really. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you just, as soon as you came, you were just so respectful. And I think that's what everybody loved. Like from the smallest things like, oh, um, is it okay to like take off slippers, uh, not take off slippers? Um, how, should I greet you like this? Should I not? Like every little thing, was you're just so conscious of being respectful. Mm -hmm. And everybody loved that. Mm -hmm. And then when we started making the video and you started to learn, you started to have conversations. We had our own conversations. I was just thinking, why can't, why can't everybody that comes to Hawaii be like this? This mm -hmm. is how you travel here. This is how you become a responsible tourist. This is how you live in Hawaii. Respect the bully. Respectfully, yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, that's, I appreciate it. I think I, I'm very conscious when I'm making these videos because one, I'm making videos about different cultures that are not mine. 
oftentimes that are minorities. So I'm spotlighting them in, in a way that often they don't get spotlighted in general. So it's even more um, pressure to do it accurately and right and respectfully. So, and it's uh, the, the mindset is, is so important because I don't know, each culture greets differently. Each culture eats differently, speaks differently. There are words that you should say and don't say. And uh, I'll do a little bit of research before, but for the majority, I, I'm not aware of it. Mm -hmm. So the best thing I can do is just ask. And I think, I think that's, that's something that, that I, that I want to, to share with my, my videos is, is it's better to, to ask and take a risk respectfully rather than not ask and stay in your own bubble and have the misconceptions and the, the stereotypes about other cultures that create the divided and the harm. So the purpose of the videos was also to expose people to different cultures, expose people who are thinking of traveling to Hawaii, who are like, I don't know if I should, should I, or I was going to, but I, I, I don't know what the right way of doing is. And now they can learn from my videos or people who don't have access to black American communities or Hispanic American communities. So they can learn about them because mm -hmm. a lot of people live in bubbles. They live in their neighborhoods where everyone looks like them. So they don't get an opportunity to learn about different cultures. And I think the lack of education is the biggest um, source of, of divide. For sure. And I think ego and pride as well, because nobody, nobody likes showing people that they don't know or they're wrong. So sometimes instead of just asking, they just pretend like they know or they just tr try to do something. And uh, if it's wrong, they kind of like try to hide the fact that they were wrong or something. But yeah, it's fear. Being, yeah. Being able to just humble yourself and say, hey, I don't know. Teach me. Mm -hmm. Let me learn. I think that's a superpower. Yeah. Teach me if you're open to teaching me. Mm -hmm. It's not your responsibility. But if you're open to it, I'm, I would love to learn. Yeah. It's funny you use the word responsibility because that's a, a word we use a lot in Hawaiian, kuleana. And I felt like I had a kuleana to show you the real Hawaii. And because you were, you know, making your platform available to not just me, but the whole entire Hawaii, I think that it was like such a big opportunity that I, I knew that we had to do this right. We had to represent our culture the right way. We had to respect or represent Hawaiians in the right light. And the video turned out just way better than we could have ever imagined. We connected with the most awesome people and a lot of things, I don't know if people know it, like really happened organically. Like uh, the first day we went into Sig Zane to uh, look at, uh, we had to get you in a little shirt. Mm -hmm. And then Sig Zane was there, <laughs> Uncle Sig. And he, not only did we, I thought we were just going to go in and like pick up, pick out in a little shirt or whatever. He picked it out for us. <laughs> he gave amazing mana'o and like meaning behind it. And yeah. it, do you remember that? It was so crazy because like, he, yeah. um, I don't, I don't remember what he did for you, but he was like saying something about my shirt and it was like a road and whatever. And my middle name is Kupono and it was like the Alapono. I'm like, <laughs> how did you know that? That's so crazy. <laughs> yeah. And then he, he, yours had a, a Lai, which is um, the lay that we just made when you came to uh -huh. Hawaii. And then I don't know, do you remember what else he said about yours? Well, I said I like green before and then he picked out a green oh, yeah, shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were saying like... <laughs> It was wild. It was like a very spiritual, like chicken yeah. skin moment. I feel like he could pick out any shirt and create any story and be like, and we'd be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's how like those uh, those tarot card readers. <laughs> that is the do. perfect match for yeah. us. <laughs> but no, the videos came out amazing, and I got a, su such positive f feedback from Hawaiians mm -hmm. who watched the video, who felt represented, who learned. It was it was really great to see. Yeah. Uh, we we did a lot of fun stuff too, like the concert on the first night had the green yeah. Paula Funga. I think Kimmy was there as well, and you you met some people like Sam Potter, who was a past podcast guest. And that we we got in just uh, I didn't have another ticket. Uncle Sig gave us a wristband to get in, and I've never. I think that was my first year going to Olahilo as well. And then we were like, I don't know how we're going to get in, but we're going to figure it out. And then my my little brother, Ku, came with us. And then we met this lady, and which I saw her again this past year. And she got me in again, <laughs> just, just coincidentally. So shout out to you. I, I, I don't know why I'm blanking on your name, but she's also at the markets. Um, she, she sells awesome stuff. I'm so sorry. But, <laughs> we uh, snuck in with your help. 
yeah, we we got in. Uh, we saw her and we're like, hey, we're going in. And she recognized me from Hawaii verse. And then uh, we carried the ladder in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's like, yeah, just go over there, take it in. And that's how we got it. We just carried the ladder. And so life hack, carry a ladder to concerts and you can get in. Yeah. Um, and then we connected with the Lewis Ohana, Uncle Keith, mm -hmm. Uncle Kavika, mm -hmm. and his family. And that was just so amazing. They they We did the emu together. Aina University. Aina University. They were so grateful for that. They they He would always tell me how people would tell them about that video. And they saw him through that video. Oh, wow. So he's, he's just super grateful for you. And then uh, we went with Lito. We learned about yeah. the uh, fishes at the university. And then we... Did that throw net, which um, I think I did better than no, you. I don't know. No, no. What was it? No. I, I totally dominated. I think you. I dominated. I forget. We got we got to watch the replay. Go, go to YouTube and watch the replay. I can't, I caught a rock. I don't <laughs> think you caught anything. <laughs> I don't think I caught anything. And then, um, yeah, we, I, I, we, we got to go. Also, we, we went to Volcano. Food on yeah. food. We, okay. Poke. Uh, I mean, went surfing. Went surf. Oh my God. We did yeah, so we did so much in that short period of time. And then, after we weren't recording, we hung out too with my friends. I s beat him at ping pong, like probably 20 wow. games to none. Wow. I wish we recorded that. 7-0 <laughs> to me. 7-0 Se to me. me. Yeah, to me. Like seven straight games I think games you would say row. 0 and 7 for if you're starting. Oh, yeah. you're saying it right. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> All right. Just just to, to be honest, I did get smoked at ping pong by, yes, by this guy. Out. My name is… Here, we'll do it. Let me be honest, because I don't want to lie to my my supporters. Oh, I'm gonna look at that. Hello, everybody. My name is Kamalka Diaz, and I lost to Mark in every single game of ping pong. Wow, this is a big big step for you. Yes, I never admitted that till now, <laughs> and it's recorded. Uh, yeah, and it's recorded. <laughs> it's so recorded. Jordan, leave this in. That was just for you because I I respect you. So wow, that's I'll cool. finally come clean. I think our friendship just deepened a little bit now. Use that word. <laughs> We're friends now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, going back to that video, it was just so cool to to be able to share that with you and share that with the world, share my culture, which I love so much, like the Hawaiian culture, and to show you my hometown. You know, anytime you have a friend come uh, visit you, it's exciting to sit, to show them the food and the people and. Uh, introduce them to your friends and uh, even though you know I just met you, you we became friends so quickly and you know, honestly I understand why you don't say friends because we're Ohana right we're yes. brothers we're you know that's this palala. is my palala yeah so yeah. I think oh Kaikena Kaikena played that night Kaikena Scanlon he, he has yeah. a song uh, so I have, yeah I have a question for you um, for me it was a privilege to be able to to join you and have a local Hawaiian show me around mm -hmm. now what if one of my viewers who's not Hawaiian wants to visit Hawaii and they would say Mark Yan, yeah you're lucky because you had someone who you knew who showed you around they let you stay at your place what about me I want to go to Hawaii I want to learn about the culture but I don't know any Hawaiians who are going to show me around how can I learn about the culture in a respectful way that's not just like showing up into someone's house in a village mm -hmm. and just be like show me around yeah well DM me I'll send you my Venmo <laughs> send me like 2000 maybe that's a, a solid 2000 and i'll show you around easy doing airbnb experiences yeah. <laughs> now <laughs> no uh again that's a really good question because not everybody is blessed with that that sort of experience and um there are people who aren't as rooted as my family is um i'm not saying my family is any better that's maybe they your family is m more into japanese culture you know that's totally fine um but i, I was just you know blessed with a, a good community growing up in hilo um, yeah, I, I think try to just look for resources online. Maybe I think the best way might be just volunteer because you show up to a community day and you can meet a lot of people. And then maybe through that, you, you meet another person, they take you here or, you know, they're open to showing you around. So meet somebody. I say, if you like, if you come here alone, you come here with your family and you don't want the Waikiki tourist experience, try to meet somebody. Even, I mean... Code DM. Just try to DM somebody and, you know, the worst thing they can say is no. I mean, the Jordan DM me and now he's the producer of this podcast. Markian DM me and, you know, we did that video. So, I mean, I think when people think of DMing, they're thinking like, oh, sliding into the DM to hit on somebody. <laughs> but no, it's, you know, a lot of my guests I get on this podcast, I slide on their DM, into their DM. So, 
the power of DMing. Yeah. You know, it it's powerful. I would I would I would share similar advice too to answer my own question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's it's um it's about meeting meeting people mm -hmm. and being human. Mm -hmm. Being human in, in the most raw, authentic way where um this because because I'm experiencing this too. I'm traveling to different countries in the last six months and I want to learn about local culture and I don't know anyone. So I just I just talk to people. I talk to the to the waiter at my restaurant. I go I walk into a shop and I just talk to the shopkeeper or the tour guide that I have and and just in the most human way. Um and through that people have brought me on to different adventures and brought me into their houses or brought me to connect with other people. So meeting people and being human, having genuine curiosity, that goes a long way. Yeah. It's a powerful tool. It's a skill. It's a skill that you can learn. You're a special type of person. And I've, I feel like not everybody can do that. Maybe somebody's not as outgoing. I feel like even I might not even be that outgoing to just ask people to stay with them. The, the times I've stayed with whole families, is, it was structured. It was a program, you know, study abroad, Peace Corps, whatever. So I had it set up for me. So to do it on your own, I mean, I know you were in uh, Samoa for a couple of months just staying with a family. Uh, uh, I don't, like, I don't even know where, how to start, like, <laughs> asking somebody, hey, can I just stay with them? It's, it's uh, funny because here's a perspective I'm playing with. Being human is not something you need to learn. It's something you need to unlearn. Hmm. And kids are, ch children are the best examples of being purely human because they're just themselves before all the conditioning of life happens through society, through social media, through people, parents, friends, whatever, where we then get conditioned and our, and our mind has all these limits and bears on how we think we need to live our lives based on the inputs that we've had. Mm -hmm. And so again, part of my self-discovery is unlearning everything that I've learned and actually being the person that I want to be and having the reactions to things that I want to have, having the thoughts to things that I want to have. And I catch myself sometimes having a, 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 an instant reaction or a trigger or, or a feeling and then being like, wait a second, I actually don't believe that. Like I actually, I'm going to choose to react differently or I don't believe that thought anymore. I'm going to change my opinion. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I travel and then I say this like being human perspective, it's, it's, um, it's it's trying to just be our authentic selves. And it's something that I think takes time to unlearn the conditioning that we've had. Uh, and I'm working on it still. But it's it's our natural state. Mm. And I think if we if we view it as something that we need to learn and something that needs to be uh, gained, then it almost puts it out of range a little bit. But if we realize that it's us naturally that at our essence, that everything we we need is within us, then it makes it much more attainable with, uh, with some consciousness. For sure. Yeah, that, no, that's beautiful. I think the way to get to that is to minus distractions, enjoy some solitude, go on a retreat. Because like you said, we're conditioned by so many different influences in our lives that we almost become those influences. And forget to be our authentic self, forget how to be ourselves. So it's like, you have to learn how to be yourself. That's like the, that's like the goal of life, right? Is to really be your authentic self. Yeah. You know, it's not making the most money. It's not, you know, getting girls and whatever. It's learning how to be yourself and truly live the life that you want to live. Yeah. And the, the question that I was asking myself is who is myself? Because I said, oh yeah, I want to be myself. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> who is myself? Yeah. Is it this outgoing version that you see or is it the more introverted version or is it the this version i was like why are there different versions of myself and which one's the real one <laughs> let me break it down and that's what i've been working on do you know who who you are i got a really really insightful perspective from my silent retreat mm -hmm. which through meditation like seven hours a day for 10 days uh, i was able to experience detaching from my from my mind and detaching from my body. I don't know if you've had a deep meditation where like you're aware that you're just watching thoughts, right? Or you're aware that you're just watching feelings. And then you wonder like, what is that awareness? Like what's the thing that can view those things? And then you, I'm learning more about consciousness and and our essence at, at our core and this, this witnessing entity. I feel like I'm throwing so many mm -hmm. big words. Oh, good. But that uh, that tool of witnessing and consciousness has completely changed the way that I view my life and myself. 
And it allows me to control my mind rather than my mind controlling me, mm -hmm. which I think before I identified a lot with my mind, like whatever my mind thought, I thought that was me thinking. Yeah. And I don't know if you feel that sometimes your mind or your inner voice just has like the most random crazy thoughts. And you're like, why did I think of that? Like, it just doesn't make sense that I would think of it. And it's not really you, you know, it's the culmination of all the external factors that you've been influenced by. And so who am I? A big step for me realizing that is the, the witnessing, the witness, the observer, the consciousness. And every day is a learning opportunity because every day as I'm by myself, I encounter so many scenarios where I have a feeling or a thought and I can just watch it from afar and then decide how I want to act on it. So it's not like I'm just sitting down and with my eyes closed all day. It's like being super conscious and super aware and unlearning all the, the removing all the, the, baggage mm -hmm. that I've accumulated naturally yeah. that we all accumulate for sure no I I agree I, like you aren't your thoughts you just because you do a certain action that's not you I like to use the like the term like exception to the rule uh, sometimes it's not the rule it's just the exception to the rule so for example like I think about kicking Jordan in the head all the time you know I know I'm not a violent guy sometimes I just want to kick him in the head I'm just joking. That's why he has a. <laughs> That's big why. Head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but like, for example, I, I'm 30 and I've had my, you know, life journey, my, in a way, meditative like experiences where I'd say that's Peace Corps, or living alone for in the middle of nowhere. Like, that was my, my journey of self discovery. So I can say, like, very confidently, I know who I am. I know, you know, I'm very conscious of thyself so when i get to i go through life and i know that i'm a hustler i know I, i'm a hard worker i know that i can do these things but some days i'm lazy i procrastinate i don't feel like i'm the best version of myself i know that's not me though i know that i can give myself grace to be like i could be lazy for today i could watch a couple more episodes of this tv show because I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to make me happy, but that's not who I am, you know? Mm -hmm. I know that this is just like in the moment. This is what I want to be right now, but it's not who I am. So that, that's how, at least that's kind of what I'm interpreting from you. And I feel like that's how I have been living my life. And that's the point I got in my life where I'm conscious of those de decisions. Uh, and once you get to that point in life, it's very liberating. Uh, you, like you say, you don't let your mind control you. You know, and I, I feel like it comes in waves. Like you're not always the best version of yourself. I'm not always the best version of myself. For the last year, I haven't, I wasn't in the best shape. But you know, like you, you came with me to F45. You know, that's like one of the things that I'm doing is like really focusing on like fitness and health because that's the best version of myself. But I always knew I could get there. You know, I, I never said in my mind like, oh, I'm lazy and fat and whatever. I knew that. If I put in the work, I can get to this where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it starts with the power of the mind, but also not like giving into your thoughts and your mind, but knowing who you are as an authentic human. Yeah, the, the mind is a powerful tool that's valuable, mm -hmm. but it's just a tool and it's not everything. And all these things are easier said than done. And it requires a lot of consciousness and awareness every day to, to build that. And I think self-discovery is a lifelong journey. But being aware is, is so powerful. Yeah. I feel like at, at points in our, our lives, like maybe even right now, you're at the peak of awareness. And because you're just coming from all of that. I'd say I'm beginning of awareness. Yeah. Well, yeah. once you, you know, it's like at the top of a mountain, there's another peak. Yeah. You know? So I feel like every time I think I'm like, I know everything. Like I know myself. And then life goes on. And you're like, wow, I really didn't learn myself. I really didn't know myself. I think it's like surfing. When you're starting out surfing, you're like, oh, cool. I'm riding the whitewash, going straight. I can surf. And then you turn and you're like, wow, I can turn. Wow, I didn't know this was a thing. And then you can cut back. And then you just keep like growing progressively. And you keep realizing like that point you thought you knew everything or you thought you knew something. There's so much more to go. I like this yeah. analogy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's what I, I realized in life. Because that's how, that's how I learned to surf was like, oh, cool. I surf. I love riding the whitewash. And I'm like, I hate riding whitewash. If there's no face in the wave, I don't even want to go. <laughs> we better go surfing tomorrow. We're going to surf. We're going to surf for sure. Okay. Yeah. Jordan's going to come with us. 
<laughs> but uh, I got a bunch of uh, social media questions. So we'll take a quick shishi break. Did I teach you shishi? Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. I've used it a lot in the last 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm a big shishi. A big shishi guy right you here. You drink a lot of I drink shishi. a lot of liquids. Shaka yeah. Tea. Shaka tea, water. Uh, I don't drink anything else. <laughs> but yeah, we'll be right back. All right. We're back from a quick shishi break here with my palala over here. We're going to answer some social media fan questions that you guys left for us. So first one comes from Six Foot Balut. This person wants to know, after your first visit with Kamaka, what's your view of America in regards to Hawaii? Mm. I think it, I think it, I think it shows the darker side of American history, of course. And that was something that we emphasized in the videos. In order to understand Hawaiian people, you have to understand the, the, the history and the pain that comes with that. Because there's a reason why, why there's a movement to bring back Hawaiian language. Because it didn't exist for a period of time. And then why didn't it exist? Well, from its history with America. So it gave me a lot more context. It gave me context. And it gave me understanding of why it's a sensitive topic sometimes and why why tourists might be um on edge and like why I would feel on edge a little bit. Because before I well I guess before I didn't even know. So I was just ah, Waikiki, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I like heard a little bit on social media, I think in the since COVID. I think people like have heard about it in terms of a uh, a lot of people moving to Hawaii to live you know, the dreamy life, but then a lot of Hawaiians not liking that. So we're aware that people don't like it, but then why don't people like it? Well, the, this experience that we had together gave a lot more context for all of that. Hmm, great answer. Okay, this uh, same question comes from, uh, or a question comes from the same guy. What is your call to action for future visitors to Hawaii? Mm, I would say be respectful. But that's quite generic, so I'll try and narrow it down a little bit. I would say, um, remember that you're a guest in someone else's land and, you know, area. Which means just uh, approach everything with a genuine curiosity and respect. And I think this is just a rule for any tr all travel. Is whenever you're going to, to another country, learn, learn how they live their life and respect whatever um, customs and behaviors and traditions they have mm -hmm. another guest said do as the hawaiians do like do as the romans do you know do as the locals do yeah don't do everything like they do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but let's get you clarify that <laughs> right because because in a lot of countries will be like learn about these things but don't there's things that you don't do as a non-hawaiian or a non whatever mm -hmm. place you're coming from and you're not going to know what you should and shouldn't do so that's why it's just ask have genuine curiosity observe and kind of follow follow the lead mm -hmm. yeah awesome even if you think it's a stupid question it's fine i'd rather have somebody ask it than not yeah okay next question comes from ulunui okamamalu this person wants to know what are some stereoty stereotypes you learned was not true when you visited hawaii this might go back to our like 17 things or whatever that one video right we, we had we did yeah Pineapple on pizza. <laughs> Pineapple on pizza. Am I lying now? <laughs> Wait, but you had it before last night. You had pineapple on pizza. Hey, don't tell me. Don't expose me. I did it. I did it. You actually, did it. he's okay. joking. Okay. Yeah, I'm just kind of kidding. He's joking. <laughs> um, stereotypes that weren't true. I th well, not everyone surfs. <laughs> and not everyone surfs well. <laughs> I th I think I think I'll answer it in a different angle. The a big realization for me, a big learning was um, this distinction between Hawaiian people and people in Hawaii, mm -hmm. like locals in Hawaii. So local culture versus Hawaiian culture. I never knew that there was a difference. And uh, and it's a different culture. And and then we, the, but it totally, it's the same in my situation where I say I'm from Spain, but I'm not Spanish because I don't have a Spanish passport or I'm not ethnically Spanish. So I guess that was a big uh realization was mm -hmm. local culture versus Hawaiian culture. How yeah. Different. It's not one and the same. Yeah. And I, th and it, it was fun. It was interesting because when we did our, our skit of 17 things Hawaii locals do, 
at first I was calling it 17 Things Hawaiians Do, mm-hmm. but you were very adamant about like, this, this is its own thing and then this is separate. So let's mm-hmm. call it Hawaii locals or people in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I love that you're really uh, open to that too. Because some some people would think like, oh, if you do Hawaiian, it's more clicks, you know. Think Hawaiians do, you know, it's, it looks better for, you know, social media and for YouTube. But yeah, I really appreciated that you let us clarify that too. Like these are things that people in Hawaii do, but it's not necessarily Hawaiian things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like eating a spam musubi. That's, that's not a Hawaiian thing. That's just something we do here in Hawaii. Which is the culmination of all the ethnicities that yeah. are here. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's that mixed plate culture. Okay, next question comes from Santos. This person wants to know, favorite thing about our culture? I would say that everything has meaning. And I think this is common in indigenous cultures because they've been around for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Every name has a meaning. Every, there's the way that you see land and nature has a meaning. The trees, the mountains, they're more than just objects. Your traditions. So I, I, I think there's a lot of depth to Hawaiian culture. That's what I took away from our experience. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Deep like the oceans. Okay, uh, next question comes from Lola White underscore fitness nutrition. This is the lady with, um, at F45, the one uh, that we were talking yeah. to yesterday. So, hi Lola, if you're watching this, she's awesome. Her and uh, her husband Ari, they're great coaches at F45. If anybody wants to go join us at F45 Ala Moana, come, come join us. Mm-hmm. One of our past guests, Lanai, he goes to that same one too. I just saw him the other day. Uh, so, Lola wants to know, what is your favorite quote or saying that reminds you of your why? So when I was making content, our why was to bring the world together one smile at a time. And the quote that I really liked was smile and the world will smile back. And it touches on karma or law of attraction or whatever you want to call it, you know, fate or destiny, where if you put out good energy, you'll receive good energy. If you're kind, then people will be kind to you. People people really value your intentions and reciprocate your energy. So smile and the world will smile back. Love that. Yes. Minoaka. That's a smile. Minoaka. I don't know if people got that in the beginning. Minoaka. I was wondering what it was. Smile. Yeah. Nice. I was trying to like Minoaka at the same time as speaking, but I'm not sure if it came out. <laughs> on the camera. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Lola also wants to know, sure, there were many moments you wanted to give up. What was it that allowed you to continue? There weren't many moments that I wanted to give up. I was fortunate that I didn't struggle much. I started making videos when I was 15, so I didn't have any rent bills to pay. I was living with my parents. Then I went to college. So I didn't need to get a job either yet. My parents were supporting me. I was very fortunate to have that. that. And then I left college be- when the channel was doing well. So I haven't struggled much in my life. And I think it's important to recognize that privilege. What kept me going if there were obstacles, I would say, is... Mm, I'm not sure. A desire to keep growing. Mm-hmm. I think growth is a is a value of mine, um, personally and in the business world. So I always wanted to keep growing my channel. And our why with content, there was always a purpose behind our content. So I think that's really important to keep the content inspiring people and to keep going. And ours was uh, positive content that brought people together. Mm-hmm. Wow, that that answer you gave really makes me think about struggle. And I always think of struggle as like necessary for growth and for people in life. And just your mindset, the way you live life, it sounds like you went through struggle, but the struggle in a different way. You know, like maybe identity, trying to figure that out or whatever. But then I'm also thinking, well, maybe the opposite of struggle like you don't need to have a hard terrible life to become a better person or whatever it is to have that big moment of growth but it could just be curiosity i feel like 
curiosity was like your your struggle, your version of struggle that made you grow a lot. Maybe. Yeah. I yeah, I I would say that I haven't struggled much in my life at but all. But you were always curious. Yeah. And I think through through that it it led to to growth, but yeah. So I I'm just uh kind of bringing that up cuz that's what I I'm thinking. I'm just speaking out loud. Yeah. I mean, I have I have supportive parents who yeah. love me, who gave me a great childhood. Through traveling, I grew a lot. A lot of myself was shaped through my childhood traveling. Parents are positive people. So I was very lucky in that sense. Nobody chooses which family they're born in. Nobody mm -hmm. chooses which country they're born in. So instead of hiding that privilege or feeling guilty about it, because not everyone has that, the best thing I think that I can do is to acknowledge it. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I don't really meet people who don't go through struggle that act like you. Yeah. Like even acknowledge it. So it yeah, I'm just <laughs> Yeah. Of I'm course. I guess I'm trying to just understand it and label it, which I don't need to be doing, but it's, it's free therapy session. Yeah. Right? Huh. Interesting. All right. Well, yeah, we'll we'll unpack that more in the future. <laughs> All right. Next question comes from Zane Kanahele. Uh, this person says, for me as a Hapahaole kid with a white complexion, it was difficult for me to be around other Hawaiian people. You being a third culture kid, where do you stand when it comes to growing up with other cultures around you? Mm. I, I I haven't had uh, the experience that maybe this person has had of... of um, feeling like 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 bullied or people making them feel uncomfortable and an outsider but i think the greatest thing to do when it comes to being in environments where people aren't you're around people who are not like you is having a sense of groundedness a sense of self-awareness a sense of identity where you can be in control of your yourself regardless of your external situation and this is this is not specific to the cultural aspect. This is just in life in general. Like mm -hmm. then something I'm trying to practice is how can I work on myself in a way that no matter what happens externally, I am ultimately in control of my reactions and my thoughts and, and my feelings. And that sense of groundedness, of clarity, of of um yeah, of control over my my contentment and joy is I think the ultimate freedom. And I'm not, I'm not there, but I think that's the, that's the path that I'm working towards. Mm. Awesome. Super cool. Last question. Oh, by the way, my, my cousin says, uh, Nicole, uh, dot underscore Arlene. Um, can we come meet you? Haha, <laughs> just, just kidding, Kamaka. That's what she says. So maybe, <laughs> so I don't know, on this, on this trip, you'll meet them. But there was the just kidding, so I don't know if it's. Yeah, okay. Wait, so maybe she doesn't want to meet you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I meet you? Ah, just nah, nah, kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Good point. Okay, last actual question comes from John R. Underscore. What was the most surprising thing you realized about Hawaii slash wine culture that you didn't know prior to your trip? I guess this is kind of like the, the, the stereotype one, yeah. Yeah. But maybe if you have another thing to share. Something else. Oh. Well, here's something small and specific that I think was the first thing I wanted to figure out is how do I actually say the word of this state in this, oh, this place? Yeah, yeah. Like people say it differently. I'm not going to like, let me, let me have them say it first and then I'll figure it out. And then I heard like Hawaii and I'm like, am I allowed to say it like that? <laughs> or is it only you guys who could say it? There's Hawaii, there's Hawaii, there's Hawaii. Where, what do I, what do I say? And then you kind of educated me in the sense of like, oh, there's Okina, right? Mm -hmm. So you have that little pause, Hawaii, and then I, all of a sudden I was like super conscious, okay, I'm, I'm going to make sure I don't say Hawaii. <laughs> like every time I say Hawaii, I'm like always, did I, did I say it right? <laughs> so yeah, how to say Hawaii, like that's a big one. And again, where would you know to learn that, especially as an outsider, and then you feel self-conscious or confused? For sure. Uh, I mean, I love that you asked that. And I don't get upset at people anymore. Because I realize it comes down to education and what you what you know. Because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So if yeah. you only watch TV and movies and where they're saying Hawaii, you're gonna say it Hawaii. Mm -hmm. You know, if you grow up like I did, you're gonna say Hawaii. 
or you know, as locals say, Hawaii. You know, it's you have a different pronunciation of the W sometimes. But in the Hawaiian language, just to clarify for people who are curious, Hawaii is the Hawaiian way to say the word. It's uh, in the Hawaiian language. Hawaii, you have the okina, the glottal stop, and between the two eyes, it looks like in a, a backwards apostrophe. So I say Hawaii. Sometimes I say Hawaii. It's just whatever comes out naturally because most of the times when I'm talking to people, I say Hawaii. When I was in Spain, uh, I would say I'm from Hawaii or Hawaii and people wouldn't understand. So I would have to say, oh, I'm from Hawaii. Because mm -hmm. they would say, Hawaii, Hawaii, oh, Hawaii, Hawaii. And they do like the hula dancer. <laughs> I have a very vivid memory of that. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it depends. I, I look at it as like, we say Spain in in uh in Spain, they say España. Or in the Spanish language, they say España. So I just see it as it's correct whether it's Hawaii. Hawaii is just like the English way to say it. Hawaii is the Hawaiian way to say it. Yeah, or it's like saying, I'm from Marbella or I'm from Marbella. So yeah. just saying the, the letters differently. I think it's different here because you have, you have a, a mission. Like you have a, a point to prove, which is, we're bringing back this language that was oppressed. Whether I say Marbella or, Mar or Marbella, Spain, nobody cares yeah. because it's not like, it's not, it hasn't been oppressed and you know, there's no point to prove, but clearly there's a movement here and you want to bring back the language. So that's why there's a cause behind speaking more Hawaiian. Yeah. Whereas if that wasn't the history, maybe people wouldn't care as much whether you said it wrong or, mm -hmm. or right, but it's charged with emotions when people say Hawaii because it reflects on a lot of other things. Yeah, it is interesting though. And this might be a hot take. We care about things way more in Hawaii than other places. In what way? In a way where we're just like so... Uh, what's the word? I wouldn't say sensitive, but we really want to like let people know like this is how we do it. Like it's Hawaii. You do things like this. Aloha spirit. We're always trying to kind of like push our own agenda in a way. Where you go to a lot of places and like they just don't care. Whether you say, uh, like you said, Marbella or Marbella or Marbella. Whatever, mm -hmm. however you want to say it. Like they don't really care too much about how you do things. But uh, I know there is a lot of history and trauma that goes into it over here specifically. But there's also a lot of other places as well that I just want to acknowledge that. So that's what I'm saying. It's like all these issues, it's not unique just to Hawaii. It happens in other places. But because it's here and it's our culture and there's a renaissance, I think it's highlighted a lot more than other places. Well, what, what, what comes to mind for me is, again, like in a lot of marginalized or oppressed communities, there are consequences to ignoring the culture or there are consequences to not further the culture because if we don't say it right or if we don't educate, then it's going to get lost. And look what happened when it got lost. Like it was, it was a bad time, right? Mm -hmm. So in Marbella or Marbella, there's no consequences to saying it wrong. But here there's clearly a cause and a movement behind saying things right. Or, yeah, saying things right. And of course, there, there's always on social media, everything is more charged and it can feel so much more uh, aggressive in a lot of ways or, or like, but that, that's to me the big differentiation of a place that cares and doesn't care is what are the consequences of saying it wrong? And if there are big consequences where the culture is, you know, eradicated or whatever, then um, we're going to make sure that we push it and we're not going to let anyone say it wrong, you know, because we need, we need to bring it back or whatever the yeah. reason is. That that's great. That what he said. <laughs> Actually, I just like I wish I said that. <laughs> uh, that's a, yeah, the very, face very good point. Yeah, <laughs> Kevin, what's how's AI looking these days? Can we can we uh, put his words and then like match sync my lips to saying it or something, <laughs> and then change the voice? <laughs> no, that was awesome. That's a very very good point. Um, great perspective. What what are the consequences? Because yeah, you're right. Because it's it's such a. I mean that. I mean that's what my dad. And like my teachers have always taught us like, if you don't speak Spanish here or French or Japanese, the language will go on. 
the people continue to speak it. If you don't speak Hawaiian over here, it's done. Nobody's going to speak Hawaiian. If Hawaiian isn't being spoken by the Hawaiians, by the locals in Hawaii, then nobody's going to be speaking it. So that's why it's important for us to be speaking it because it's our kuleana, our responsibility to continue it. Yeah, and there's mm-hmm. such an emphasis, which can feel intimidating or, um, yeah, like you were saying, it can feel... Almost like pressure. Too. Yeah, very exactly. Like, pressure. I, wanna, I really want to learn Japanese, but like, I'm Hawaiian. Shouldn't I know Hawaiian, you know? Yeah, and that's something that I, <laughs> I won't ever relate to, but I'm sure that you, you, you guys feel it a lot. And so it's, it's, it's almost like honoring both sides of, yes, let's push this, but also let's keep uh, our sense of individualism in the sense of like, let everyone have the freedom to do what they want. And you shouldn't feel bad if you wanted to learn another language or if you wanted, you know, yeah, if you, if you lived a different life. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I wonder if I still would have been interested in learning Spanish if I didn't already know Hawaiian. Because my decision to learn Spanish was because I already knew Hawaiian and people would tell me like, oh, wow, you speak Hawaiian and you you can learn other languages so easily. And then I would always tell them, well, I grew up speaking Hawaiian. So it's not like I learned it. I mean, I, I, you learn it every single day just by speaking it. And I went to Hawaiian immersion school. But I, I tell them, do you remember a time when you didn't speak English? You just spoke it growing up, right? You didn't learn how to speak English. You just spoke it. So that's how I feel with Hawaiian. Yeah. So I never actually learned a new language. So that's why I wanted to learn Spanish. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But yeah, I wonder now if I like didn't speak Hawaiian. If as an adult, I would have been like, oh, I need to learn my, the, my native language. And maybe that gives you some mm. empathy for people who didn't learn it growing up and who yeah. are trying to learn it, but are maybe struggling because it's a hard language, I presume. So, nah, F those guys. They better learn that joke. <laughs> they should learn it in six months. Yeah, learn it now or you're <laughs> off of the <laughs> island. <laughs> it should be a TV show. Oh, you got... Or, you or you're off of the island. Like it can be what something else, but or you're off of the island. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think about that. Any producers out there that want to produce this show, let us know. (laughs) Well, mahalo everybody for those social media fan questions. Make sure you leave some for our next guest. It may be a question. We'll make it on the podcast. All right. So we're coming to the back end of the podcast. It's an amazing conversation already, just like I expected. Mm -hmm. I like to ask my guests, what does keeping it aloha mean to them? You know, what is the phrase keep it aloha mean to you? Even what does aloha mean to you? So however you want to answer that question. So from my experience, which was being invited to your family and house and culture, keep it aloha. I would say, hmm. It's lihi moyam pineapples. It's uh, (laughs) yeah, yeah, I remember that. I want to say, I want to say that there's a sense of sharing and that it's, it's not just, it's not just some, a way of life for yourself, but it's contagious in a way. It impacts others the way that you are, decide to be, it impacts others and it spreads the spirit of giving love, beauty, positivity, all these, these feelings that I experienced with, in our experience. So let's say the it's it's giving in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. We are a giving culture. And I've been to places that are similar. And those are the places that I feel most at home. Yeah. Yeah. And like you, you, you tell me when I, I ask you, like, where do you want to settle down? Or like, where in America would you like to live? <laughs> You're like, I don't want to live in America. I want to yeah. live abroad or whatever. Yeah, I gravitate a lot to Latino cultures and that mm-hmm. the warmth of how open the people are. And maybe it's because I'm familiar mm-hmm. because I grew up in Spain. And maybe maybe ultimately, as, as humans, we just like what we're familiar with. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Every time I, I talk about like, because people hate on America. People do. People do. You mean and out, it's, it's usually the, the people. It's usually the people in America. <laughs> Um, oh, a lot outside too. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that is true. Especially with like your... presidency and stuff. Yes, <laughs> yeah, for politics. sure. Yeah, politics. Um, but 
<laughs> Where was I going with this? <laughs> uh, I would. Well, I don't even know where I was going with this. Um, America, America, <laughs> the good and the bad, and the the ugly. good and the bad. I was gonna say about living here. Oh yeah, about like the different cultures. Like, I don't. I hope this podcast or like even the video we made on YouTube. I hope it didn't come off as like us hating America. No, it didn't. It shifted the conversation from what it, does it mean to be American to what does it mean to be Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like even if I had to choose where to live, I would like to live abroad. I wouldn't want to live in the States just because I feel like the culture isn't what I like. I guess you say you gravitate to like your home culture. But yeah. I just feel like outside is so much better in the sense of not a sense of like political structure and <laughs> stuff, but just like in culture. Yeah, every, I guess it's all meaningless and subjective in a way. Like it's all down to opinion and what you like and don't like. Mm -hmm. A lot of great things about the U.S. A lot, a lot of things that are better in other countries. So it's ultimately what you, what you, yeah, what you like. For me, I I loved living in L.A. for the last seven years, and now I'm like, I need a break from the U.S. I need, a, I, I want to be in a country that doesn't speak English. I want to be in a country that does things differently. So it's just personal preference. Mm -hmm. You're just you're just yearning for change. Yeah, and I I guess. The, the privilege that I have is that I know that that's an option, whereas a lot of people mm -hmm. don't even fathom leaving their country, let alone their town or their city, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I have, the world is my oyster. For real? Cliche. Yeah. How, how long do you think you'll be traveling for? I put no end date to it, so it'll be until I get burnt out or bored of traveling. If I had to guess, maybe two years. Two years maybe, more of traveling? three wow. years. Well, it's been six months. And I'm approach. I'll be approaching a year, obviously, in six months, and I'm still very excited by traveling. So it'll be, I mean, I'm guessing, longer than a year. So yeah, maybe two years, maybe three, or maybe more. Who yeah. knows? Like I, and I, I don't know how I'm gonna feel in a year. <laughs> we'll figure it out. I think the craziest thing about that whole thing, like what what you're doing, is you're traveling, but you're not vlogging about it. You're not taking pictures of your dinners and the cafes you go to. You you're just traveling and living, being present. In every place that you go. Yeah. I, I feel like that's pretty rare, huh? Yeah. It's very liberating to not have to work and to also travel without having to take a photo of everything yeah. or to think about video ideas that I could do while I'm here. Like I take, I only take photos for myself, but I, I besides that, I don't film anything else. I'm just living in the present, living in the now, finding the joy in the present and it feels incredible. Is that the goal for us as humans, just like to be free like that? I think the goal, how I'm framing it right now, is the goal is to be content, mm -hmm. ultimately. And it, everyone will find what makes them content. For some people, it will be to not work and travel. For some people, it will be to find their skill and work on that and build that, whatever it is. So ultimately, I think it's about contentment or fulfillment and purpose in these things and doing what brings you that. And everyone will have their own vehicle. Yeah, and I guess it's different because we don't have kids. I mean, there's no commitment, so it's not like you have responsibilities right now. No but responsibilities. May maybe as you know, we get older, and if you have kids, then that's like your goal is to care for them instead of travel. So I right. guess it just changes as life goes on. Or it's again still contentment, but mm -hmm. it looks different. Mm -hmm. It looks like caring for your kids uh, instead of yeah. traveling, or maybe doing both at the same time. Yeah, I feel like people could look at your life and become jealous or envy that. And think, wow, he's so lucky. He gets to travel and just do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to work, whatever. But let me remind you, for 10 years, you hustled and you put in the work so you could get to this point. I worked hard and I was lucky. Yeah. Were we talking about it? Like all our conversations are blending now. Were we talking about it before this podcast or in the first half of this podcast about um, like what you work and then you save up all the money and then what, what do you do after you enjoy it in the second half of your life? I feel like you're enjoying yeah. it in the first half of it. Was it this podcast? <laughs> yeah, I think both. I don't know both. both. Yeah. It's, it's, it, this is a tough one because we've been with each other for the last three days. So I don't, I don't remember what <laughs> we talked about already. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I got lucky in a lot of ways. Supportive parents. I have an American passport. I got right timing with Facebook. 
ad revenue and all that. So the question is, how much of it was luck and how much was it was hard work? And hey, that's an interesting well, you question. You know what they say about luck, right? It's like you make your own luck, something like no, that? No, it's it's when opportunity meets, or preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, but opportunity feels like it's luck. Like, I, I know what you There's mean. There's different types of luck, though. I know what you mean. I, I, I wouldn't say it's blind luck. Like, it didn't just fall into your lap. But maybe it did. I didn't choose where I was born, like you, I said. You're getting real retreaty on me right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the... It's the full picture in my mind. Like I think I think it would be limiting to just look at a certain section of my life. I got lucky with my parents. Again, you don't choose your parents. And your parents influence a big part of your life. Your first, you know, 18 years of you're not you're not conscious enough to make your own decisions. You're just a child. So I got lucky with my parents. And someone, if someone wanted to travel like I'm doing, but didn't have an American or French passport and had a, I don't know, a Moroccan passport or a Samoan or Fijian passport, they don't have the same privileges that I have. They wouldn't be able to just go into all these countries because they have to get a visa and that's difficult. And they have to use their own currency, which is not as strong as the the dollar or the euro. Like all that plays a part. And it's, I think it's easy to think, yeah, I worked really hard, which I did. And and to think, you know, 90% was hard work and yeah, I got a little bit lucky, but I don't know. Maybe it's the reverse. Maybe I was 20% hard work and 80% luck. Mm-hmm. Like, this is the full picture. This is the full picture. And I don't have the answer to it, but I think it's important to see the full picture. I think, I think you would say that because you, you really have no ego. I Good. still have an ego. Well, I think so. Yeah, let me take that back. I feel like everybody has an ego. I think it's like being able to control it, how big and how small it is at different times. Yeah. Because for me, I don't know how other people feel. Like when I hear like you're lucky, I almost get offended by that because I feel like it invalidates people's hard work or what they did. Well, that's a belief that yeah. you have. Mm-hmm. And I have a different belief. I have a belief that, yeah, I am lucky and I work and that. Your belief says that it does. They can't work together. You said, "Well, I guess it depends what we're talking about." Because, like, what, you gave me a new perspective of like you being born to a great fam to a great family, and I feel the same. Like, I never thought of it like that. Like, I I got lucky. I won the the parent lottery, the family lottery too. Mm-hmm. Even though I, my parents were divorced, they were still able to be amicable and still raise us with great step parents mm-hmm. and half siblings and step siblings. So. I, I don't think about, about that as luck. I guess oh, in the sense of business and entrepreneurship, I guess that's when I, when I hear the word luck, I feel like this wasn't luck. This is sure. timing. I mean, yeah. But I guess I use the word blessed instead of lucky instead. Like instead of saying I'm lucky to have a great family, I said I'm blessed to have a great family. But again, semantics. Yeah. 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 I, I guess my desire for... To, for truth and clarity is bigger than my ego in a way. Mm-hmm. Like obviously I still have an ego, uh, but I care more about understanding and having clarity on it than caring that I look good or, you know, that people don't invalidate me. So that's why you dress like that today. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a I'm cool leaving. shirt. I'm leaving. That's a, that's a really cool shirt. Thank well, you. Tell us about your shirt. Oh yeah. yes, it's an Ethiopian shirt. Mm-hmm. And that's uh Ethiopia, it's like a Christian Orthodox shirt, I believe. The mm. patterns. Is this, that's what about the pattern. necklace? This, I think I got, I forgot where I got this. <laughs> <laughs> I wore it in Jamaica though. I remember that. Okay. No, it matches the, the fit. And this I got in yeah. uh, living in a Native American family. I got this at a powwow. Oh, that's cool. Which was part of my episode of the series. Cool. I'm just a little offended you're not wearing all the things I got you, but whatever. Wait, cool. what, did, what did you get me? <laughs> I don't actually remember. I don't think you gave I gave you a anything. shirt this morning. But you couldn't wear it because then we would be wearing the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be weird. One <laughs> gift. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's you got a couple more days, okay? I'm, I'm gonna gift you some other stuff. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh speaking about truth, I know this isn't really part of our podcast. Like we don't really talk about it, but you went to Israel mm-hmm. and then you went to the um you're also in the Middle East and you went to the, the pyramids and we talked about it a little bit. Like, dude, that's aliens, right? Pyramids, that's just Who aliens. Built the pyramids? Right? Can like do people not agree with that? Like, I don't I don't Some understand. People think that. 
I don't, I don't, I didn't look into it a lot, but just hearing the th little things I did hear about it and about like the geometric shapes and whatever, like that gotta be aliens, right? <laughs> it is an impressive structure <laughs> that is, no one understands how, how it's built. So maybe you're right. Maybe you know something that a lot of people oh, don't. Oh, no, no, I don't. I don't know. But I'm just like, with my little knowledge, the only thing that's gonna, I kind of give me peace is like, Aliens built that. Egyptian aliens. Egyptian aliens. <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> yeah. What what is what is the 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 biggest thing you you've taken away from your travel so far? Oh. Besides the uh, pyramids were made by aliens. Clip this. Ooh. I, I guess it's 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 been just fun kind of like ice cream sampling each country because I know that I'll want to settle down at some point and I'm just saying I'm just, you know, trying all the samples of the ice cream mm -hmm. and experiencing different countries and seeing what I like and don't like. And then it's it's kind of like I'm building my own character in a way. I've been I've I've really been seeing life as a video game throughout these travels. And it it, to it totally feels like a video game where I'll wake up in Paris, walk out of my hotel, and just be like, where do I want to go today? <laughs> like in a video game, you know? Oh yeah, like Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then and then I'll talk to people, and each person is a side quest because sometimes I'll talk to someone. And then they'll bring me to an adventure or they'll propose something and I'll follow it. And then someone else brings me to another, other, another adventure. So it totally feels like a video game. It's so cool because I played video games. So. Or a simulation. Someone else is controlling, <laughs> is playing my character. So just treating life like a video game. Uh, that's just been, it's just fun. and That's so cool. Liberating and freeing and exciting. All positive words. Yeah. That's so cool. I, lo I love that you use the side quest. Totally. I was in I was in Fiji a month ago. I woke up one morning and I said, I want to live like Moana. <laughs> I've had this fantasy, like it's just so dreamy, the Disney movie. And so I started asking people, like, if there's going to be a place where I'm going to live that way, it's going to be on an island like Fiji. So I asked locals, like, where, where can I have this um, experience? Or, mm -hmm. or how can I live in a village? And who do who I talk to? And then eventually someone connected me with their dad's friend in the Yasawa Islands. I went there, I lived in the village, climbed the coconut trees, you know, hiked the mountain, jumped in the water with the kids and the beach and lived like Moana. Awesome. What are you more, uh, the most grateful for? Most grateful? Oh, so many things. I'd say my family. Loving, supportive, positive family. Mm -hmm. I'd probably say the same thing. I would probably say the same. I would say the same thing. Yeah. So your dad it comes from a, a business background and you're kind of a self-made uh, entrepreneur with, with a lot of help from, you know, knowledge from, from your dad. But you built your own, your own thing, you know. What is the best business advice you can give to aspiring entrepreneurs or people that even want to start a YouTube channel? Ooh. It's to start a, a YouTube channel, treat it like a business. Eventually, when you're at a stage maybe like where you're at, where you've got something going on and you want to build it further, it's become a become the owner, not the operator. So work on the business, not in the business, and delegate. That was that was um this the our, a lot of our success as our Smile Squad channel was building a team, having a team. I was doing it all by myself at first, and there's only 24 hours in a day, and only so much that I can do. And once I hired a team and was able to delegate a lot of the work that others could do and probably even better than me, then that just grew the channel mm. a lot. So, delegate. Is it hard to give up control though? If you have an ego, yes. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I, I like totally... That's I, why like, you've been struggling I, with it. Just like anybody can... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't have an ego, what? And you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll do the things that only you can do. And that's, that's what, I, what I realized. Someone told me, it was like, just do the things that only you can do. I don't need to pick up the props for a video or I don't need to film this. I can have someone else do it. So, but creating the vision, that's me. Or if I'm the face of the channel, then I need to be in the video. And even that I delegated mm -hmm. by having other creators as the face and changing it from Mark Yan to Smile Squad, which meant that we could impact more people with our mission. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, I guess, the final thing I'll, I'll tip I'll add is like, what's your why? Have a purpose, have a mission with your content because that's how you're going to add value and that's how you're going to go deeper and impact people. 
Mm-hmm. And that's people buy your why, not your what. That's mm-hmm. what Simon Sinek says. That's awesome. Yeah, my thing is I, I'm I'm okay with like giving up control, but I was just joking about that. But the thing I'm I'm worried about is like if people can do it the way that I expect to do it. Like I expect myself, I have high standards for myself. When I cut these clips or when I listen back to the podcast and I say, Hey Jordan, cut this part to this part, post it like this with this caption, that's what I'm worried about. Well, it's all training and it's easy to do because there's a formula happening in your head, whether you realize it or not. It's all science. It's not like you have the perfect eye and it's all subjective. It's you have the same way that you you cut the clip at the same time. You leave a little bit of breathing room here. Your captions start with a one sentence summary. Like it's all formulaic. So you just need to put what's in your brain down on paper and then teach it to someone. That's what I did when I had it, my first editor. Every single thing that I was doing while I was editing was just a formula. The music was the same. The, or like the, the volume started at this, you know, measurement and this measurement. So I just put it down on paper, taught my editor, and then he could do it. So, yeah. so can I hire you? No, I'm not working. <laughs> you're, kind of, you're kind of busy right now? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on. All right. Okay. What is something you wish people knew about you that they don't? Mm. Jordan said he's taller than he thinks, or he was. He's. I'm he thinks. You, yeah, you were taller than he expected. <laughs> <laughs> I thankfully I don't care for people to know my exact height. Um, I guess just it's not much that I care for people to want to know about me because then it kind of implies that I like I get validation from them. But all that psychological stuff aside, I think just that I have a cultural background. I think that's a cool fact about me. And I think if you just looked at me and heard me, you would think that I'm just like white American. But uh, I think there's more to me than that. For and sure. people will figure that out. And maybe it's good that they don't know because it's kind of like a surprise. It's like a, yeah, well, yeah, whatever. And like, oh, okay. Just, it's like a bomb. Like you drop. You know? For sure. No, I love that. I love when people are unassuming like that. Yeah. Because it's it's so interesting. And then it makes people curious. And at least for me, I say, I want to learn more. I want to ask questions. Yeah. Like, um, this this one girl I just met at uh, the fashion show, she um, a past podcast guest introduced me to her, and like I would have just thought she's not even from here, but apparently she's like from here. It does not look like has like a very local background. And I'm like, wow, yeah. So she she's gonna be a, a future podcast guest. So I, I'm just trying not to spoil and use names, but uh, okay. like stuff like that. It's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's been a some, surprise. Yeah, I love I love being surprised. I love when my judgments are completely wrong. Cuz as humans we're just we judge. That's what we do. We look at somebody, we judge. We make our own assumptions or whatever. And then I love when I'm just like totally wrong on somebody mm-hmm. in a good way, in a good way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Our mind judges and we often listen to whatever our mind says. Yeah. And so we can just observe and not follow through with it. But that's not often the case. Yeah, we, it, uh, it's an automatic response. For sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what is a question you wish I asked you today? Are you going to ask me about the hack? Well, no, I am. That's the, that's the last question I ask. I'm getting there. Did you, I wish you asked me um, how many followers do I have? <laughs> <laughs> And it's 15 million for the record. Oh, wow. 15 million, yeah, actually? Yeah, across all platforms. You yeah. were just talking about one page. So you were right, I, I but was, just about, you know, about one page and I have multiple like pages, multiple platforms. Right. So is that 50%? That's that's a failing grade. <laughs> oh, and views? I said seven, 7 million. Yeah. Yeah, we were. We also got 10 billion views. 10 million? Billion. Total. I was looking at an outdated uh, resource. Well, that's why, yeah, I'm bringing it up. <laughs> Because that's really important for me that you get my views and my followers right, or else, who am I? <laughs> well, I'm that so was sorry. that was kind of that was kind of cool, right? That <laughs> that's, like a, that's a, a that's a that's a good flex. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> kind of powerful. That's like, cool to say, like I don't know, like oh, that's, that's a humble flex or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said it was so much riz. Uh, it's like a movie trailer, just yeah. But anyways, so actually, ten billion views. Yeah, across all platforms, majority on Facebook. For followers and viewers, 10 billion, billion views in the last 10 years. We're at, I think we're at like 20 million. <laughs> That's awesome. This, 
That's it's amazing. Not billions. No, it's not trillions either. But if, people get. Tri- oh, I guess like no, people Mr. don't Beast get trillions. Stuff. But I'm saying the point is that there's always more that you can compare yourself to. Yeah, yeah. So don't dismiss yourself where you're mm. at in comparison to someone else. Yeah, yeah. Comparison it's is awesome. a thief of joy. What they say. Yeah. No, does Does Mr. Nice Beast one. have a, a trillion? You think? Well, a trillion would be a thousand billion, right? Um, he has billions, absolutely. No, I don't think he has no. a thousand billion. Do you think anybody would it, be able to get to that point in YouTube? Yeah, actually, maybe, maybe, maybe he does. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe he does. Well, look it up. It's fine. Also, I don't care that much about it to really look into it. No, not a yeah a thousand. <laughs> I'm, I'm like working it out. Of my head. That's <laughs> a lot of a business guy trying to do all the math. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So I know you really don't have a plan set out for the next, you know, year or whatever, but what are your future goals and like, what is the legacy you're trying to leave? I don't care about leaving a legacy currently. Maybe I will in the future, but it feels something that feels superficial about it. Um, and then what am I, what are my goals? Just to be happy. That's it. Just to be content. I don't, I'll find my vehicles for that, but that's ultimately the goal is just to be happy. We're on this earth. We don't know why we're here. There's the feeling of peace, love, joy that feels good. So I just want to feel that. Mm -hmm. Family. Yeah, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, yeah, those are all the the practical aspects, which I can't predict, but just to be happy. That's yeah. Whatever it'll look like in the future. Okay, um, right before we get into our life hacks, so I just kind of want to like dive into your mind a bit because it's so interesting. So like when you wake up, you don't have a plan. Like what, so what's going through your head? Like what's what's going on in Markian's head? Like what am I going to do today? Or like it's literally, it's the most, it's literally whatever I feel like doing. And that's, that's and I'm not exaggerating. It's even when I travel, I buy one-way tickets because I don't know how I'm going to feel in a week. Maybe I'm going to like mm-hmm. the place and I stay longer or maybe I'm not going to like it and I want to leave there. And then when I want to leave, maybe I'm going to want to leave to an island or maybe I want to leave to a city. I don't know. So let me just buy the ticket when I feel like buying it and where I want to buy it to. And the same way when I wake up, it's like, what do I feel like doing today? Okay, well, I'm going to go eat, obviously. That's, that's usually something I do. And then do I feel like socializing or do I feel like doing sightseeing or do I feel like meeting people or just being alone? That's what goes through, goes through my head. It's, I have nothing to do. I have no responsibilities. I have no, nothing on my to-do list. So it's whatever I'm in the mood for. That's, that's, that's what my life is like. That's so cool. So when you came in late Sunday, when did you come in? Friday. Friday. Sorry, Thursday. Friday, yeah. Thursday, Thursday, Thursday night. You re- just wanted to come with me to F45 and get your butt kicked. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, it feels good to work out in the morning. It's yeah. probably good for my body. So this guy's a beast. That. And then he did three minutes in the cold plunge. Yeah, it's good. It's good for the body. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, I'm just like, you're awesome. I, lo- I just, I enjoy talking with you. And thanks. Just man. like you're trying to understand how you view life. I think a lot of people can learn from it. I'm older and I'm learning so much from, from my young and real over here. And that's, that's a, a great philosophy to have is to be a constant student yeah no matter who it is younger mm-hmm. older different culture sure. age whatever yeah awesome okay all right so we'll come to the part in the podcast where you get to share your life hack with us so what's your life hack well besides kind of a predictable solo traveling hack of like go solo travel i'll give i was i'm, I'm gonna give a more practical hack and that's a password manager Hmm. Do you know what that is? No, but I have all my passwords in my notes. So if you steal my phone, you, you can just access my whole life. That's exactly why you should have a password manager. <laughs> a password manager is basically an app or a website or an extension that creates passwords for you for every website and stores them. So you don't actually have to create a lot of passwords. You only need to know one password, which acts as your vault of passwords. And every time you go to a website, it's a, it's a fill-in. It's like an automatic password oh, filling. Oh, okay. I've done that before on, on my laptop. Yeah, you, like, exactly. Sometimes it pops yeah. up like Apple yeah, yeah. keys or whatever. But but having control of that, sometimes it's, before it was messy. Sometimes you have some here. Sometimes you have some there. So, but once I, I created, I, had, I added a password manager to my life, 
it's it's been such a joy because previously I would have kind of the same password, but with an extra exclamation mark or question mark, which isn't the safest. Mm -hmm. And then I would forget passwords too. So I have to like make it up uh, again. But this just makes life so much easier. The one, the password manager that I use is called 1Password. It just makes life so much easier. You create these really hard passwords that obviously are safe and you don't have to remember them. You just need to remember your main password, which obviously you don't share with anyone. It's just one password and then it saves. It saves across devices. It saves across websites. So that's my little hack. That's cool. So it connects to all your like emails and social media accounts and everything. Yep. Anything that you have a password for, it'll create it and store the password. And so you just fill it in. Just fill in. It feels so great to not have to type out a password. Just press fill in. So that's that's really good. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And this guy is really about optimization. So you you gotta. We've been talking about it the last couple days. You still gotta show me about like the email stuff and. Oh yeah, creating filters for your email so that the you know emails automatically get foldered and out of your inbox. There's a lot of things that I've like, I've been excited to optimize. Yeah, yeah. But for real, you gotta show me that stuff. And I also now I I realize about like how you wake up and travel. So if if you leave by tomorrow, I'm gonna guess that you didn't enjoy hanging out with me, huh? It's been two days, so give it a five out of ten. <laughs> two days too long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, here is my last fast fave five questions. It's just rapid fire answers. Okay. Okay. Favorite country? Spain. Favorite airplane snack? Mm, peanuts. What kind? Just like salted. Regular, salted. Yeah. I like the roasted kind. Yeah. Yeah. They they don't do sweet like caramel. Oh. That would be a winner if they did that. Okay, favorite way to recharge? Being alone. Nice. Favorite song to listen when traveling? Las Cosas Pequeñitas by the, No Lasco. The small things? Yeah. How does it go? Give us a sound. Nero, nero, now. No, nero, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forgot the words. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but it's great. It's flamenco. Yeah, yeah. Flamenco. We've been listening to some bachata. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some Prince Royce. What was mm-hmm. it? Romeo Santos. Good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Favorite hobby? Soccer. Oh, yeah. Watching and playing. Nice. Would you rather watch or play? Um, Probably play, but only if it's competitive yeah. and quality. I don't like playing pickup, uh, especially as a midfielder. I'm a passer and pickup, it's not about passing. It's Scoring. people hogging the ball. Yeah, yeah. Not passing, so yeah. Okay, well, hopefully you can get you in my game tomorrow. Yeah. It's last game of the season. If you guys pass the ball, yeah. Well, uh, you can pass the ball to us. You just might not get it back. But it's not <laughs> passing, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's all we have for this uh, episode. Mahalo again for giving us the honor of having you here on the podcast and coming to visit us here in Hawaii. I know we have a fun day planned out, so... We're going to get on with that. Is there anything you want to share, leave for the audience? Um, no. <laughs> Actually, can I, can I have you do something? Yes. Can you look at your camera? Yeah. And can, just in case we cut this, because I know you have such a huge, loyal, awesome, smiley fan base mm-hmm. can you can you just leave them something like if you wanted to say something to them i know you made a post on social media you know saying what's going on but like yeah yeah if you just want to say anything to them well i appreciate all the support that i've gotten from from my fans over the years i wouldn't be able to do all this without your support and i just, I just have gratitude thank you for for supporting me and watching my videos and i hope i've left a positive impact in your life. Girls from that smile squad. Smile squad. <laughs> so I was going to say where, I usually ask people where can uh, we find you, but I mean, kind of just off the grid right now, so. Yeah, I mean, all my stuff is still up there. If you write my name, you'll find it. Um, but Markian, mm-hmm. Hawaiian episode with Kamaka, maybe that's a good starting point. For sure, yeah. We we have, so we made a funny uh, seven rules for holidays or something. Or Yeah. Yeah. You can go check that out on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, 
Let's get on with the rest of the day. Mahalo, Mark Ian, for joining us on the Keep It Law podcast. Bread Aloha, be kind to one another, and mahalo for listening to us today. We have new episodes every Thursday, so make sure you follow us and leave a review. I'm your host, Kamaka, and remember to always keep it aloha. Shakas and minoakas. Thank you. <laughs>